You know, my teaching last year on this Torah portion was amazing. I was looking over some of it and I was like, wow, that was really profound. So I don't know, if you, you should just go home and check that one out on the internet if you haven't caught it. We're actually going to cover a little bit of that material again this year because it was so good. But we're also going to cover some new stuff. So, yeah, Let, let's, look at the, let's look at the Torah portion, the reading from um, the Torah first. If you want to open your uh, Bibles to Exodus chapter 25. So um, you know how we like to keep things practical, eh? Um, this is a really fascinating parsha because the whole thing, you have to think about the context of it. This whole thing takes place on a mountain between the Holy One Himself in this big cloud that's like burning and stuff and this guy who hasn't eaten or drank anything in a week. It says Moses went up on the mountain and he was up there for a solid week. And then Yahweh began to speak to him. Can you imagine just like blocking a week out of your schedule and climbing a mountain and not eating or drinking anything? That, that's the context for this whole passage. It's kind of nice because a lot of the Torah is kind of smudged with our human messiness, hey? Like people are killing each other and there are these sibling rivalry and lots of family dysfunction and, you know, there are a lot of laws about, well, if you do this, then you die. And if you do that, then you die, etc., right? And, and this is just such a beautiful parsha because the whole, thing, the whole thing is birthed in the glory. Like the whole thing takes place as, as a divine revelation to a man who is in a very, a very high state of holiness. So I really love this parasha for that reason. And uh, it, it's fascinating too because, okay, it seems totally impractical. Like it's about fancy boxes and these angel things woven into curtains and like, I don't know, I, I don't know. Like some people, if you're an artist, you really get into this stuff, you know? But if you're like practical minded, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes to connect. So we're going to try and break this down and get some, get some practical, meaningful stuff out of this parasha. How does that sound? All right, so let's look at Exodus chapter 25, verse 8 together. That's where we'll start. This is like the kicker for the whole parasha. This is the theme verse. And this is something that applies to us. How's, how's my sound here? Is it okay? Okay, great. He says, um, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. So there's the bottom line, what the job is, and there's the heart of the Almighty, right there. Let them, what's their job? Build the sanctuary. And what am I passionate about? You can almost hear him saying, dwelling in their midst. Um, in, in the Jewish world, that's understood as a commandment that applies in every generation. Uh, it's regarded as the commandment to build the temple. So when the Jewish people returned from the 70-year exile in Babylon and they rebuilt the temple under Nehemiah and Ezra and the men of the great assembly, they were acting on this verse. They were building the sanctuary. Uh, there's a movement in Israel today, the, the Temple Mount Institute movement, to rebuild the temple, the third temple. And this is their flagship verse. They would say this is the verse that applies in every generation to, uh, to build the temple. Um, What's the whole point of this? The point of it is so he can dwell in the midst of his people. So we don't live in Israel. Maybe we're not directly involved in any temple building movements, right? But this verse definitely applies to us. So let, let's, look at, let's look at that together. Um, I, I, I want to break it down for you in Hebrew, and we'll just try and get the full feel of this, because this is the practical, this is the practical uh, side of it for us. So when he says that I may dwell... Among them, that Hebrew word is Shechan. Everybody say Shechan. Shechan. S-H-A-C-H-A-N. And it means to, uh, like to dwell, to abide. It's where you make your home. It's where you live, right? Where your permanent residence is, like your fixed address. So he's saying, I want to do that in the midst of my people. Um, the, the tabernacle that they're building, that, the, that this is all about, it's called the, the Mishkan in Hebrew. Everybody say Mishkan. And it has the same root, like the ma on the front means it's a noun, right? So shechan is the verb, it's where you live, and your mishkan is uh, where you live in terms of your home. So, like, tabernacle is a really fancy religious word that, you know, nobody uses except in a religious context, unless you speak French, and then you use it in other contexts that are not good. So it's, it's better, you know, we're trying to get the idea behind this, right? It's like, the, it's the, uh, the mishkan, like, the home. Um, here's another word that you may be familiar with. Uh, how, how would people say it in English? Like uh, Shekinah or Shekinah. You hear about that word, right? What does that word mean to you in English? 
covering, glory, presence of God. Okay, yeah. Like there's there's a camp, um, Shekinah down down uh, by Waldheim. Maybe some of you have been there. Beautiful facility, but that's the name of it. So th- this is an English word that actually doesn't come to us um, f- straight from the biblical Hebrew. This comes to us from it's a more of a, uh, a Mishnaic Hebrew word. It comes to us from Jewish tradition. Uh, the, 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 in Hebrew, it's called the Shechina. It's kind of it's kind of like it's a challenging one because you say Sha and Cha right next to each other without a vowel. Shechina. Everybody say Shechina. Shechina. Yeah, excellent. And, and the idea behind this word is like where God lives, where His presence is. He, he's there. Um, someone had mentioned the glory. It has that connotation also. His glorious presence. So that's the idea. Um, where, where does he say, in terms of the location of this, of this objective, where does, he want to, where does he want to live, make his home? Um, he, what, what, what he says there is, in their midst, uh, the Hebrew is betocham. In, in their, uh, and I, I want to read you, um, here's my, like, my well-beloved pocket Hebrew dictionary. I've been through this thing a couple times in its totality because I'm, I'm one of those Hebrew nerds and I actually read the dictionary. Um, so I, I won't read the whole thing to you, I'll just read one word to you here. Because it, it'll give us more of a sense here. Like this is his heart's desire as expressed in this parasha, right? So the, the, the concept of in their midst is in the middle. So in the middle of them. In the center. So he desires to live in the center of his people. Is that on a collective level in terms of like, okay, so here's the, here's the camp of Israel and it's two miles by two miles or whatever and he lives right in the center. Or, or could it also be referring to in your center? isn't inside of you. Who knows? I mean, hey, we're spiritual beings. You have a spirit. You know, it says that's where he lives. Uh, Paul talked about how Messiah dwells in our hearts through faith. Maybe. Um, Within is another word. And between. I kind of wonder about that between one. When you think of between, you think of two parties. And then a preposition between those two parties. Maybe that applies to us as the body of Messiah. Maybe that applies in marriages. Maybe he desires to live between a couple in, in the marriage in the marriage context too, and show himself in his glory. Yeah, that's kind of um. Those are those are some of the. Uh, if you want to break down that word, that's the broader understanding of it. So, here's a paradox. Like, isn't the creator of the universe omnipresent? What does omnipresent mean? It means he's everywhere. Yeah. Like, isn't he everywhere? How can he be somewhere? For him to say that I may live in their midst implies that he somehow wasn't in their midst to some degree. Like, isn't that a, an affront to his omnipresence? I don't know. It's just what he said. I, I know. I, I personally, I love verses like that because it just it breaks me out of a theological box. You know, sometimes we want to like develop this idea that God is like I don't know this kind of ironclad, like unassaultable version of God sitting on the throne, like cool and collected and kind of running the universe from a distance. This is the image of Him that I've had to fight, right? And, and I don't know, like sometimes we forget that like He's there to be encountered, like He wants us to know Him personally, and so He'll throw these verses at you just to break your paradigm, just to like get you off of, if you kind of feel smug, you think you have kind of the corner on truth, or you, you know everything about God. Maybe you, maybe you went to seminary and you took systematic theology, so of course you know everything. If you've taken systematic theology in seminary, then you know everything there is to know about God, right? So then he throws verses like this at you just to maybe break your paradigm. So I don't know, I just think it's interesting that somehow or other he is in some places more than in other places. Or he's in some groups of people more than other groups of people. Kind of like he's omnipresent, but we're not always cognizant of his presence. Actually, Genevieve and I were talking about that yesterday, and it, re- it was really profound. Like, I was just saying, you know, I, I really want to be closer to God. And she was saying, well, I mean, he's right here. Maybe it's, maybe it's just realizing that he's right here. Like, he's already really close. Maybe it's just getting close to him or something. I, I don't know. So that, that, that kind of floored me. Like, wow, it's a different paradigm. Good point. You don't go to the wilderness to do a big construction project usually. There's some logistical challenges there, isn't there? Hmm. Wow. So I'll, I'll give you the Hebrew word for the sanctuary too. It's a mikdash. Everybody say mikdash. And you spell that M-I-K. In English you spell it M-I-K. D-A-S-H. Mikdash. Um, the root of it is kadash. What does that three-letter verbal root mean in Hebrew? To set apart. Um, to separate as holy or dedicated 
Yeah, exactly. So the mikdash is like, uh, it's translated as sanctuary, but it means like uh, a set-apart area, a holy place is the concept there. And um, the, the, the temple, in the Jewish world, the temple is called the Beit HaMikdash. What is Beit? House of. Ha is what? The. And then Mikdash is? The sanctuary. So the temple in Hebrew is called the Beit HaMikdash, and it means like the house of the sanctuary. Literally, or the, 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 the house of the, like, the set-apart place. It's kind of difficult to give a good translation, but that's the idea. But the set-apart place was in the house, so it's still flowing. Right, that does flow. So here, here's, here's, the, here's the key here in terms of action. He says, let them build it for me. Let them construct me that mikdash. D did you notice he didn't say, like, let one person do it? Or Moses, you go and do this thing. This was a community project. This is something that they could only do as a body. I wonder, uh, okay, uh, you know, of course, we're not just talking about something in history past here, hey? Eh? Uh, we've been discussing for the last several weeks how we as a community are laying the groundwork for a move of God. We, we are preparing ourselves for Him to come and really show Himself in our midst in His glory uh, to a greater degree than what He has yet done. I mean, there's so much more to him than what any of us have experienced. And I want to know him. I want to see his glory expressed. I, I want to see it expressed in ways that will impact our, our world and, and bring, like, healing and what's right to Prince Albert. Uh, you know, I could go on and on about that, but you get the idea. So th th there are things in this parsha that apply to us as a community as we prepare for, for his glorious presence, as we, as we make a home for him, in our midst, as individuals, as families, and, and as a community. So that's the first thing we want to take note of. This is a community project. So this isn't something that I do by myself. It's not something that you do by yourself. Like, if we want to see the full expression of the glory of Elohim, of God in our midst, it's going to happen in community. It's going to happen in that broader context of the body, body of Christ, the body of Messiah, right? We need each other. That's the first thing that I really want to nail home. What's that? Actually, that's the next thing. Like, we're, the, the Hebrew word there for building or constructing is asa. Everybody say asa. So that's, that's like, in English, I'd translate it A-S-A-H, asa. And it literally means your action or what you do. It has, the, it, has the, it has the connotation here of building or constructing. So we get this idea that we as a community are like building a special place for him. We're, we're constructing a home for him through our actions, through what we do. Does that mean just on Shabbat when we gather as a congregation? Or is that something that starts in my life every day and in your life every day? Maybe in our family life. Wow. I, 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 that's where it gets really practical, you know? Like, as we go through the course of every day, just saying like, Father, we desire your presence in our lives. I want to see your glory in my life. And so I'm going to structure my lifestyle according to that desire. I'm going to make choices that will welcome you, that will tell you that I, I, I would love for you to come and make your home in my home. You know, um, often in the Western world, um, we think, you know, well, you know, church is the holy place and, you know, you go to church if you want to connect with God. And I mean, congregation is, is a wonderful place to connect with Him. But, you know, when we read the scriptures, we see very quickly that it starts with you and me in our hearts every day. And then it starts with our families. Yeah. So that's something to be thinking about, you know. Are we praying together as families? What do we do on a daily basis to tell the Holy Spirit that He's welcome in our homes? And then we come together on Shabbat and we share the overflow of that, right? Actually, along those lines, in 25 verse 2, maybe this kind of like gives the tone too for this whole concept of building a sanctuary for him in our midst. Um, he says, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me, a teruma. That's why this parasha is called teruma, a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. So did you hear that? This whole thing is based on people's voluntary action. You know, like th that desire for him, that desire to be a part of that construction project. So, you know, we, we, we read in um, Paul's epistle from this week about how where his spirit is, there's freedom. Like there's this freedom, and that's one of the overtones of the new covenant. So you totally hear that there also, eh? As his heart moves you, as he prompts you, as he stirs that desire in you, you, you move accordingly and you, you, um, you help build the sanctuary. So... And you know, that maybe that can be our, like, our homework assignment for this week. 
just asking the Father in your own communications with him, what can I do to make you more welcome in my life? What can we as a family do to build that sanctuary for you in our home? And is there anything in our lives that makes you feel unwelcome? Is there anything that you dislike that we could eliminate? These are some of the things that we can be, we can be asking him in this upcoming week. And we do ask you, Father, that you would, you would show us along those lines um, what, what you're saying to us, and we thank you for it. Yeah, so I want to look at another big theme here. Um, there's this question, eh? Sometimes people are like, you know, I, I really need to hear what God is saying to me in this situation. Like, I so need his direction, and I just don't know if I'm getting it or not. Sometimes, um, sometimes you'll hear things along those lines, or someone will say, you know, like, I just, I feel so far from him. And I don't, know, I don't know where to find him. I don't know how to get closer to God. Um, you know, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of questions like this, unanswered questions hanging in, in, in people's minds. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people in, uh, in the religious world and in the secular world have no mission in life. Like, just kind of floating through life, um, maybe just doing what people tell you to do or following the trends or whatever. You see it all over the place. Like, missionless existence. And... Uh, I suggest to you that actually in the picture that's given in the Mishkan, it, it, gives, it answers all of these questions. So let's look at this. This is fascinating. Our Creator is fascinating because, I mean, He could just sit there and be like, okay, so this is the way it is and just tell it to you straight, right? But until, instead, He gives all these elaborate construction details and He's like, okay, so build this box and this is how big it's going to be and then put these things in the box and then make a tent that's so many, that's this big and make it these colors and like... This is a really creative way of communicating. You know what I'm saying? So like if you can't really lock in and start to say, okay, what are, what are you trying to say here? What's your heart in all of this? It's kind of like, wow, that's really cool, but I totally, this is totally going over my head. You know? So let's look at a couple of things in here that are really going to maybe be more practical things for us in this Parsha. In, in um, Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, he says, There I will meet with you and from, from above, this, and then he lists where, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So we have three, we have three elements here, eh? And this is like, this is what people are reaching out for in our world. Um, firstly, he says, that's where I'm going to meet with you. So he says, there's a specific place where you will encounter me. If you want to have a rendezvous with me, this is where you're going to find me, right? So that's the first thing, there I will meet with you. Then he says, and from there, I will speak to you. So if we want to hear his voice for ourselves, this is some practical stuff for us. And then finally he says, about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. The Hebrew word for commandment is mitzvah. We've been talking about this. It has the connotation of mission. So like the commands of God, that's your mission, right? So when we, when, we, when we study the scriptures, when we hear his voice, when we encounter his commands, the sum total of his commands are his mission for you, for me, for us as a community. So, you know, if we feel missionless, if we have a missionless existence, we don't have a clue what our purpose is and we're just kind of floating, this is the answer right here. So, so let's have a look at this thing here. Let, let's continue to break it down. Um, firstly, he says to build... A box. Okay, so there are a lot of fancy words in this parasha, like ark. Like, we don't really use the word ark in our society, do we? Um, Noah's ark is about as far as it goes. Like, you know, a massive boat. Um, ark. Well, the, the Hebrew word there is aron, and it means a box. It means a fancy box. Okay, so he says, build a fancy box, and um, put something in the fancy box. He says, put the testimony that I give you in the fancy box. Okay, what, what, what's testimony mean? This is another word that we just don't really use much in our culture. Testimony is like um, witness. Yeah, it's also witness. It's like what you, what you say is true. Um, you know what I would understand it to be like? In that case, they took the written word that he gave them on Mount Sinai when he brought them into that covenant relationship with him. That was the testimony, right? So, um... I'm, I'm going to give you an example, a couple examples. If uh, you had a couple and they were really in love, they were in that courting scene, and the guy was writing love letters to the girl, each of those love letters would be like a testimony from him to her. Because in it, he says, this is, this is my heart for you. This is, this is what I'm thinking about you. This is how I see you. That's his testimony to her, right? 
We wouldn't use the word testimony because it's so clunky and not romantic. But that's the idea. Okay, it's like something that's true. Something that you're stating is true. So um, you could almost look at it as like the fancy box. It's like if the girl, let's say she had a really special box, a really pretty box, and that's where she kept all the love letters from her, from her bow. Let's use an old word, okay? That's where she kept all the love letters from her bow. That's like the idea behind the fancy box and putting the tablets in the box, right? Because, I mean, just talk about putting the tablets of the testimony in the ark, and I just, I can't connect with that. I'm sorry. It's just... It's, it's like, it's words that we don't use, right? I'm trying, I'm trying to really get to the heart of this passage so we can understand how it applies. So that's kind of, that's kind of the idea there. I'll give, you an, I'll give you an example from Genevieve's and my relationship. When we were courting, we were doing the long distance thing, right? I was timber framing in Alberta and she was going to university in California and we would email and so, you know, I, w- I would email her and, some, and she'd email me back and I really treasured those emails. Like, man, there has never been a time when I would like, like just run to my log into my inbox as soon as I got home from work as I did then, you know? Because, like, well, maybe I got something from Genevieve. It's real pretty special. And, and anyway, so I made a special folder in my inbox, and I labeled it Meocheded. It's like Hebrew for special, right? It was like my special folder. And that's where I'd put the letters from her. So it's almost like, okay, I'm talking, like, on, uh, kind of on a, like, a digital term, right? I'm kind of talking on a digital level, but that's the idea. Like, the love letters that he sends you, his written word, this is where you put the thing. So that's the idea here, okay? So remember, remember we're, we're talking about, he said, there, there is where I'm going to meet with you. There is where I'm going to speak to you. There is where I'm going to give you the mission. So um, what's at the very center of the national life of Israel? The written word in that fancy box, right? The, the written word of God, his, his witness about himself, his, his self-revelation to us as a people. Hey, like most of us in this room are holding that in our hands, so we're not just talking about some stone tablets that disappeared, who, whoever knows when, and that were carried around in a golden box in the wilderness, right? You have the written word in your hands. Yeah, it's written on our hearts, right, by a spirit. Right, our hearts are where we hold the witness. So not just on page, or not just in a, in, in a folder in our email account, eh? Oh, I love that. And it is digital at all, it's 10. It's digital, it's 10. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. <laughs> you are a genius. Yeah, ten, the Ten Commandments, and then digital, our fingers, digits, ten fingers, okay. Wow, that was impressive. Okay. I, 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 lo- I think on that level too, so I love that. Um, okay, so let, let's, let's continue to break this down here. Um, we're going we're gonna to start to, um, I, I need to picture this for you. Can, can I borrow someone's scriptures? Okay, I'll, I'll take this one, and then Mike and Shoshana can check. Okay, so let's just say, like, let's just use this as a picture, okay? So here we have, like, let's say this is the written word. These are, like, the tablets that went in the ark, right? And uh, we know what that means. Now, we have a fuller understanding. And then in, um, so that's in Exodus 25, 16. Okay, in tw- Exodus 25, 17, in the next verse, he says, make a, uh, it's translated here as a mercy seat. Um... The Hebrew word there is a kaporet. Everybody say kaporet. Okay, it's from the root Hebrew word kapara. Everybody say kapara. And that means like a covering. It has the connotation of a lid. So the fancy box has a lid, okay? And uh, it's from the root word kapar, which is a verb to cover. It has the, it has the uh, connotation of atoning for or propitiating for, right? So, um, like, you know, when Yeshua shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of our sins, that was, that was atonement. Right, he was atoning for us. It's the same word. In Hebrew, that's his kapara. All right, atonement is kapara in Hebrew. And that's the word for this thing um, that, was over the, that was over this. Um, can I borrow your toilet cover? It's the perfect color. It's the perfect color. I'll just take this. Okay, we're going to... Okay, okay, generally in, in, um, in the Jewish tradition, you wouldn't put things on the Holy Scriptures, but we're just going to do this for an analogy, okay? Um, okay, so let's say that this, as long as everyone's all right with that, I don't want to bother anyone's sensitivities. Okay, so let's say that this is the lid on the box. This is the, this is the kapara, okay? It's like the atonement. It's even red. It reminds us of the blood that was sprinkled on it every year, right? So we're going to build on this analogy. This is like the whole concept of the sprinkled blood. What does that mean to us as believers in Yeshua? Um, yeah, it could also it could represent the atonement of Yeshua. You know, the fact that he suffered on our behalf. Like, he was so sick so that we wouldn't have to be sick. 
You know, he, he took the penalty so that we wouldn't have to, etc. It's, it's the gospel, right? So this represents like the written word and this represents the gospel, all right? And this is like, this is the box. And then what is on the, uh, the box? It says in Exodus 25, 18, there are two. It's like, it's uh, Landon's word that he got to read. It's the cherubim, right? The cherubim. And there's one on either side. Um, the, what's, what's this concept? What does a cherub mean? Um, you know, usually you think about like little fat little naked babies fluttering around like when you use the word cherub. I mean, seriously, it's terrible because it's, it's totally the opposite. I mean, if you ever like saw a cherub, you'd be screaming and like you'd drop dead almost, you know, like you're talking massive power here, like beings. I don't know how many stories tall they'd be. So hopefully I'm just trying to get us out of the, out of the mindset of like fat little babies, you know. Um, okay, so that's like cherubim, right? And there's one on either side. Um, this word is spelled with a kuf on the front, the Hebrew letter kuf. Um, it has a related Hebrew word, okay, like the root of it is karav, right? Um, it has a related word, oh sorry, it's spelled with a kaf here, but there's another cognate word in Hebrew that's spelled with a kuf. They're pronounced exactly the same. What, what do you call that, uh, grammatically speaking, when you have two words that sound the same but are spelled differently? Synonyms are, re are, are similar words. I think it, it's a homonym, isn't it? Genevieve and I were talking about the difference between a homonym and a homophone because we're both nerds and we talk about stuff like that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, we were talking about grammar. But um, whatever the case may be, like, so the idea behind these things, this verb, karav, which is the root of cherub, it means to come close to. It means to draw near to, okay? Like when James says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you, he's saying karav to God and he will karav to you, okay? And there's one of these beings on either side and this is what they're all about. So um, at this point, I need two people. Um, let's see, let's see. You know, this is about Midrash. We were talking, I'm going to share another word with you in a minute. Could I, like, um, nominate Emily and Cindy? Could I nominate you two for this? Because I was explaining something to you, I think, a week or two ago about, about Midrash and scripture-based discussion. So here's what I want you to do. Um, I want one of you to, like, pretend you're the cherubim, okay? So one of you can stand there, and one of you can stand here, and, like, um, just face each other, right? So, okay, great. So you're the cherubim, okay? And you're like on the, on the box and you know, over, and then here we have like the written word and then we have like the atonement that represents Yeshua's blood. And so you represent like, like us when we, when we draw near and worship, okay? And um, what does it say about these, these um, cherubim? Yeah, it says their wings are stretched out. 25 verse 20. So like stretch your wings out and um, kind of stretch your wings out so your, your wings are touching each other. Yeah. Okay, great. You have wings. But you've never had wings before. Okay. So it says in verse 20, the cherubim have their wings spread upward covering the, the, the kapara, the mercy seat, with their wings and facing one another. So you're facing one another. Um, the faces of the cherubim are to be turned towards the mercy seat. So in Hebrew, what it says there is like, it's, it's, I really love how it says it in Hebrew. It says, Ish el achiv. It literally says, like uh, a man to his, to his brother, facing his brother, to the kaporet, to the atonement. That's the idea. So like, um, in, in this case, it says like a man. I guess in this case, it's a woman. But like, uh, every woman to her sister, to the atonement, is the idea, right? And, and, and here's the thing. The father says, this is where you're going to encounter me. Like what you see here, he says, this is where you're going to encounter me. This is where you're going to meet me. This is where I'm going to speak to you. This is where you're going to receive your mission. So do, what, what this pictures, do we ever do this in our, in our spiritual lives? We totally do, don't we? Like when you crack open the holy texts and you're, and you're seeking his face, uh, maybe on your own or, you know, as a congregation, when we, uh, when we just thank him for the, for the gospel, for forgiveness through Yeshua's blood. You know, when we remember that he redeemed us from the dark side through Yeshua's shed blood, this is what happens, right? And we come into the glory of God. Because where, where does he dwell in the middle of this whole thing? He dwells like right here. It says that's where he's enthroned, right? This is a picture of his throne. So like, you know, when he is enthroned, when he is ruling, when he is calling the shots and ordering the universe, this is the place that he says from whence he does it. Isn't that powerful? Wow. So it's, it's a picture of us as community. You know, as we, as we pray, as we, as, we, as we commemorate the gospel and Yeshua shed blood, as we, 
as we not only face him, but face each other. And, and look at this for a second. Let's say these two, these two worshipers, when they look at each other, who do they see each other through? His glory is right here, right? So like when Emily looks at Cindy, she sees Cindy through the glory of God. She sees Cindy on the basis of the atonement. And you just think about that. Like, how does that look when we look at each other? You know, I look at, I, I look at Wayne, and I see the glory of God. I see a reflection of who he is. You know, um, we look at each other and we say, wow, Yeshua died for that person. Our Savior shed his blood for that person. Man, that's powerful, hey? And, and I, that's where... What? Are your goals tired? Are your arms getting tired? Yeah. So, so that's... Yes, it's a picture of the heavens also. Hmm. The box is a footstool. So uh, we don't want to make you work out too much. I know that can be kind of hard. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of our, our picture with that. Say a little thanks to them there. Yeah. I'll let you guys have your stuff back here. So uh, we, we, we did this last year, right? Um, maybe some of you remember. Uh, I don't remember. I think Mike and Colin were at Cherubim. Or, no, it was, or was it Herb and... Um, Herb and Wayne, I can't remember, but anyway. But you know, I just, I just love that picture. For me, it really brings this parsed to life, and it makes it practical, too. So um, let's continue to grow in what we just saw pictured there. I mean, really, we experience that every Shabbat morning, eh? And um, yeah, it's meaningful. So I, I just love that. You know, our faces to each other as they are to the atonement of Yeshua. So again, it's, it's underscoring the fact that the gospel is our common ground. And the Torah, right? We even saw the picture, the, the written word, which is, you know, the Torah, and the gospel. They go hand in hand. It is the common ground that we have. It's the basis of our fellowship with each other. Um, I want to share one more insight with you another, um, about another of these um, pieces of furniture in this tent. Uh, the he okay, I want to talk about the table for a minute. Because the, the Hebrew word for table is shulchan. Everybody say shulchan. It's a modern Hebrew word too. It's just how you say table. Uh, S-H-U-L-C-H-A-N is how I would transliterate it. Shulchan. And this is fascinating. Um, we were talking about apostles and prophets a couple weeks ago. And uh, reordering our priorities to factor those, those roles in to the, the Messianic community, etc. And... Uh, do you remember what the root word for an apostle is in Hebrew? An apostle is a shaliach. The root is shalach. It's that verb to send, right? Uh, did you notice the word for table, shulchan, has the same root? So in Hebrew, um, conceptually speaking, there's a connection between the, the table and what it pictures and the apostolic role and that apostolic uh, activity. What's the connection, eh? Uh, let, let, let's look at this together for a moment. He, um, he talks about the table in Exodus chapter 25, verse 23 and on. And then in verse 30, Exodus 25, 30, he says, You shall set the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. So uh, the Hebrew word for bread is what? Lechem, and then uh, this term here is lechem panim. What is panim? Face. So the lechem panim is literally the face bread, the bread of the face. And uh, it's here translated as the bread of the presence, and it does have that connotation. So it's like bread that has something to do with like his personal involvement. You know, like when you're, when you're interacting personally with someone, you're kind of talking on a face-to-face -face level, right? So it has something to do with that. And then that word there for all times is tamid. Everybody say tamid. Um, the offering, the morning and the afternoon offerings that were made every day in the temple are called the tamid offering. So it could mean at all times, but it more has the connotation of something that's regular. It was offered regularly, every morning and every evening, right? So it's like bread that represents personal interaction with him like being close to him in his presence on a regular basis, right? It's kind of the idea here. So, so let's, let's break this down a little bit. What does this concept of like the table and this bread have to do with an apostle? Huh. Okay, we were talking about how, wh wh what's an apostle? Apostle is another one of those words that isn't used outside of a religious, a religious framework, really. We were talking about how an apostle is basically like a, a, an emissary representing a king, 
would be an apostle. Um, a diplomat representing a government essentially is an apostle. Um, someone who is sent with a mission from one person to another person. Someone who is authorized to do business on behalf of someone. That would be an apostle. right? So um, in that regard, all of us, that, that, that is something that I believe is available to all of us that we can all move in. You know, when you, uh, when you receive a mission from God and you accomplish that mission, you are, you are operating on an apostolic level, okay? Um, you, you represent the king to the world around you because his name is called on you, right? In that regard, you are an apostle. You, you represent him. Um, maybe that doesn't mean you're full-fledged or whatever, but it's something that we all carry. It's, you know what I'm saying? I'm trying to break this down so that we can understand it kind of in a, like plain terms. The little things are actually very big, aren't they? Absolutely. Hmm. So here, here's, here's an analogy for you that maybe will break this down for us. You, if you can imagine going home and receiving a phone call tonight from a top aide in Prime Minister Harper's cabinet, and they're saying, you know, um, you may not be aware of this, but we've been, we've been monitoring you and you've come to our attention and... Um, uh, Prime Minister Harper would like a, a personal meeting with you and if you can imagine them flying you out to Ottawa next week and, and sitting down with Prime Minister Harper and him saying, you know, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for some people to be a close inner circle to me to represent me and to represent my government. Um, we have quite a few posts that need to be filled and you're currently not equipped to fill those but this is what we're going to do. You are going to sit down, we're going to do lunch together several times a week. You're just going to sit down at the table with me and um, we're going to have a meal. And, and I'm just going to, I'm going to, just going to start sharing with you my thoughts on different issues that come up, on situations as they arrive. I'm going to, I'm going to give you my perspective on a regular basis. And uh, in the course of three years, you are going to be fully equipped to represent me. You're going to be very well um, well acquainted with my thought processes, with my opinions on various issues, uh, after which um, I'm going to um, send you to a post, let's say, with the UN or uh, with in, in some rule where you will represent my government. Yeah, th th this, this to me is the idea behind the connection between the table and what it re represents, eating bread with someone on a personal level, you know, in the context of personal interaction, on a regular basis, long term, and the apostolic, right? So um, how, how does that look for us? Um, Yeshua is the king. We are in his kingdom. We are, uh, we are loyalists to him. We are, we are uh, yeah, I like that word. And, and he's inviting each one. This is, this is, the thing is, okay, that thing with Harper will probably not happen, okay? If any of you have political hopes, I totally support you in that. It may not happen, but here's the thing. The king, like King Yeshua is inviting you to his table. He's inviting you to come and sit down with him, and not just to do a little lunch or to have a, grab a coffee, but like to have a full-fledged meal on a, like a couple times a week at least. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and over that meal, he's going, to, he's going to share his perspectives with you. He's going to divulge his strategies to you. He's going to give you key information about his government and what he's up to and what he's going to be up to. What did he say? He said, in, in, in John um, 14 to 16, he said, I haven't called you servants. I've called you my friends. Because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've told you everything that my father's told me. So, I mean, this is something even higher than just being an aide in Yeshua's cabinet. This is something even greater than just serving in his, uh, in his government. This is actually being a close personal friend of his. And, and, and this is the relationship that he invites us to. Wow. So, you know, next time you um, spend some time with him in prayer, next time you study the word, think of it in that context. You're like doing lunch with the prime minister of the kingdom of God, right? Like you're having a meal with the king himself. And he's, he's preparing you to represent him as a diplomat. And he wants to give you... I don't know if I could use the word plenipotentiary, but like he wants to empower you to do the works of his kingdom, to bring that healing to people's lives, to set people free. Yeah, isn't that exciting? Like that's the call. Um, wow. Yeah, well, here, here. Well, let's, let's finish that thought with this verse. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. What does he say? Look, I'm standing at the door 
and knocking. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door to me, I'm going to come in. And I'm going to what? Sup with them, eat with them, dine with them, and they with me. And then what does he say in the very next verse? He says, if, to those who overcome, like to those who win this thing, the idea of overcoming is winning, right? To those who win in this game, they're going to sit down with me like I sat down at my father's right hand. Like that's a position of relational intimacy. Like when you sit down right next to the king, that's like where the queen sits, right? Like the, the king lets the queen in on everything. And as Messiah's bride, that's the place that he has reserved for you if you overcome, if you go through with this thing. Yeah, they'll sit down with me. They'll wield that authority. They'll, they'll, um, they'll hear from me on, the, on, that, on that close level. Yeah, I mean, it's the Holy Spirit that makes that real in our lives. He actually said, get this, he said, it's actually better for you guys that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I, won't, I can't send the Holy Spirit to you. But if I go, then I'll send the Holy Spirit to you and he will be in you. So you just think about that, like, yeah, I mean, like, seriously, I'm sure we've all daydreamed at some point about actually following the Master, like sitting literally at his feet and learning his teachings and stuff. But you know what he says? He says, it's actually better for you that I'm gone because then you can have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And that's even a closer relationship. Like, I, I, that blows my mind. I don't even understand that physically. But that's the level of closeness that we have with our Savior. Um, I, want, I want to share one more theme with you from this parasha. Uh, it's a very practical one. It's one that I wish I'd learned in my teen years because I missed out on some wonderful experiences, um, but it's not too late. Um, I'll, I'll share three verses with you, and they all have the same idea. Ch uh, Exodus 25, 40, he says, See that you make them after the pattern for them, which was shown to you on the mountain. Okay, so here's the idea. The Holy One has this template. He has this design. He has a pattern. He has a plan, and he shows it to Moses where? on the mountain. And then he says, okay, Moses, listen, be really careful that you go down and you do what I showed you. That's the idea, okay? Um, chapter 26, verse 30, he, um, he essentially says the same thing. He says, then you shall erect the tabernacle according to its plan, which you have been shown, where? On the mountain. And then in uh, Exodus 27, verse 8, he says much the same thing again. He says, um, Make it hollow with planks as it was shown to you in the mountain, so they shall make it. So here's the idea. And this is something that doesn't just apply to the prophet Moses. This is something that I believe applies to each one of us. There will be times in our lives where we will go up on the mountain. He'll take you up on the mountain. I don't know, have any of you climbed a mountain at some point in your life? Yeah, we, Genevieve and I have, have climbed some pretty hardcore mountains in Israel. And in other places, I've actually done some stupid things with mountain climbing that I should never have done. I almost died. I'll tell you about it later sometime if you want. But, um, but it's spectacular. When you climb a mountain, like, you're so high up, there's nobody around, and, and the view is breathtaking. And uh, the idea here is, like, Moses climbed a mountain, and he had a mountaintop experience where, where the Holy One revealed himself in his glory. And he, uh, he was given a mission. Like, he was shown the plan. And that was only the first half of the equation. What was the second half? Okay, now Moses, now you go down the mountain and you do the stuff I showed you. You carry out the plan. You accomplish the mission, right? It's really tempting for us. Sometimes we'll, like, we'll have one of those, um, those epiphanies. You know, you just have a moment where he shows you something and it's glorious. And, and the danger is to just sit there and bask in it for the rest of your life and never go down the mountain and do it. Incorporate it into your life. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I mean, the Master hit this over and over and over again. If you know these things, you're blessed. When? If you do them. You know, um, the, whole, the, the construction analogy. You build a house without a foundation, and then a storm hits, and the whole thing collapses. That's what happens when we hear the Master's teachings, and we don't incorporate them into our lives and act on them, right? So, like, this is, this is a big theme, right? Shemoying in Hebrew, it doesn't just mean to do. It means to, uh, to hear. It means to hear and to do, to obey. Absolutely. So um, th there are a couple of things we can get about this. Uh, firstly, he has, he has a vision for you. He wants to take you there. Um, make sure when he takes you up on the mountain, when he gives you the vision, that you take it seriously. Um, sometimes I don't think we even realize that it's him communicating to us. I, I had experiences in my teens where like, I was in like, the thick of his presence. And it was intense. Like, 
the fire was burning in my soul. And he would, he would give me a mission. He would, he, would, he would show me something that he wanted me to do. And I didn't know it was God. I just thought I was like having a really wild daydream. Seriously. I was like just imagining doing this amazing thing for God, right? And, uh, and that's as far as it went for me. And I'm sorry to say I, that happened quite a few times. And then finally he showed me like, no, this isn't just a wild daydream that you're having. This is my spirit speaking to you and I'm showing you something I want you to do. And um, that, was, that was a pivotal moment in my life, eh? So, so one thing we can learn is like, identify when it's him speaking to you. Your heart may burn. Um, you may just have this clear picture of what he has for you. Um, I'll, I'll give you another key. Uh, be humble about it. Moses went down and then the community built that thing together, right? So no Lone Ranger stuff. What happens to the Lone Ranger? He gets shot, right? So that's what my brother likes to say that. And um, so, you know, like, you know what, there will be times when he'll give you an individual mission, but we, we as a community are here to support each other, to back each other up. You know, I have times when I will feel that the Father has given me a vision in some area, and I won't just like, I won't just run with it. I will go to my mentors, to people I'm accountable to, and I'll, I'll run this by them, and I'll, I'll ask them to critique it and to pray with me. And if they feel like this is, this is good, this is something from the Father, then we'll go with it. Um, that's what happened with our congregation here in PA. I didn't just take this thing and run with it. I, I have mentors. I said, you know, we're at the point where we're feeling like the Father is leading us to start a congregation in Prince Albert. Um, please pray with me about this. What do you think about this? Honestly, do you feel like this is from him or not? And, um, and they gave me their honest input. And if they had put the brakes on it or if they had told me they didn't feel like it's the right time, I would have submitted to that, right? So that's the other half of the equation here I'm talking about with this whole vision thing, right? So um, anyway... Yeah, I'll share a story with you, okay? This is, this, is like, this is an area of regret in my life because I didn't understand this whole concept of receiving the vision and then doing it. Um, there was one time when some very good friends of mine from Rostern and I um, drove out to BC for a youth conference. And it was, it was a very powerful youth conference. Like, the Holy Spirit was really moving in our midst and we were just so on fire for God. And, oh man, like, we drove home... Like, I think we just drove straight through from BC and it was like two or three o'clock when we were like going through Saskatchewan and we like prayed for half the drive. Like, like he was just so real to us, you know? And we were just praying that we'd see his kingdom come and that he would rock Canada and all this stuff. And you know, we had this idea and it was so vivid in our minds and like everything in us wanted to do it. We just had this idea to hike all the way across Canada and pray, just pray across all of Canada like literally from coast to coast. And like, we were like, wow, we want to do this thing, right? And, um, and, you know, we were old enough to do it, you know, in terms of like legal age and stuff. And it was just, it was one of those things where looking back, I know that was the father and he was, he was offering a mission to us. He was giving us a vision. And because I didn't know that that was him explicitly, I just thought it was a really cool idea and we daydreamed about it and then we just, we didn't do anything with it. Like, it, it, was a, it was an example of a failed vision in my life where he gave us something and we could have done it and it would have been awesome. And I just never did it. I and I regret that, you know? But at the same time, I learned a valuable lesson from that. I think that's really okay. I think that's part of the learning process. Yeah. Not to be too hard on yourself about that. Yeah. Because you're going to have to do For sure. And I mean, you know, I, I, I'm sure that if he really wanted to have it happen, maybe he would have gotten in my face somehow and told me like, this is me and I want you to do this. It's not just a wild idea, you know, but, but whatever. But like looking back, you know, I've come to realize, I, I've come to recognize his voice more, hey? And I think that's an area where we can all get sharper and we can watch for his voice. And you know what? It might not be some massive glorious experience. It might just be a little prompting. Why don't you ask this person how they're doing on a deeper level? You already asked them and they said they're doing fine, but... I want you to ask them again, how are they really doing? What if that's, what if that's the vision for that day? Could be something that simple, right? Yeah. Yeah, the 42 journey, like stopping points in the wilderness. Absolutely. It's such a growth process, eh? And I'm still in it. We're all still in it. I love that fact. Yeah. So, um, okay, here, here's one more thought about that. You know, I've come to realize... Uh, not all of us are visionaries. Not all of us have those moments where we have an epiphany and our heart burns and we get like this massive vision from God or whatever, you know? Um, I, I think maybe that's connected to the prophetic gifting sometimes. I, I think I've come to maybe understand that. Um, here, here's, here's a thought for us. There are times when I'll be like, okay, Father, um, 
you know, I'm just not hearing from you and I don't know what to do. And I don't know what the vision is. And at those times he's shown me, it's, you don't, I'm not telling you because I'm telling someone else. And I want you to go and support that person as they accomplish the mission because they need a support team. Right? And so I've had times in my life where I'll just say, okay, who is God talking to right now because I want to go and get involved with that. I want to go support that mission. I want to become a part of that. Eh? So um, you know what? It's not like each of us have to have our own vision from God and our own unique mission, right? I mean, it's not the way it has to be. Uh, this applies on a community level too. And I look around this room and I can see like so many of us, we, we have areas where he's called us in something and we can support each other in that. Like um, even Hannah, like uh, some, of, some of the outreach things that you're doing with the First Nations on, on the reserves, it, it's amazing what you have with that, you know? And I've been thinking this week, it's an area where the Father has spoken to you and, and you're carrying that out and, and you're on the front lines. And I mean, we, we still wanna be a community that supports you, you know? Um, yeah, th that would be an example. So if you're not getting the vision, ask him if he has one for you. And if he doesn't have like some specific thing, then ask him who you can support, who you can back, right? Um, I don't know, what do you think? Is that, is that a good practical application of some of the stuff in this Parsha? And the small things aren't small. I, I've been listening to K-Love recently. They're like the big Christian radio station in the States. And I love the music they play actually. It's some really good worship. But one of their disc jockeys, he always says, the little things are actually the big things. He says something like that, and, and it's so true. Yeah. Um, let's do like a five minute overview of the, uh, the readings from Paul's epistles if we're ready to move on from the parasha and then we'll, and then we'll wrap so um, I'm not going to take too much time on any of these things I just want to touch on a couple things um, first, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4 it's like this personal glimpse into the apostle uh, this, this is the verse where we learn that first Corinthians is a tear spattered epistle. First Corinthians, like it wasn't written from some cool, objective place on Paul's part. Um, he says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears. So I just think, you know, when if we read the scriptures in that context, like firstly, the heart of Elohim, the heart of God, and then secondly, like the heart of some of these authors, some of the heroes of the faith, it's going to help us connect with the scriptures more. Like, read 1 Corinthians as the tear-spattered epistle. Read it as a, as a letter that was written from Yeshua's emissary, like in agony over this congregation and some of the stuff that was going on. When we read it in that context, we're, we're going to understand it. Um, I, I really like this, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.14. He says, uh, just as you um, personally did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours, in the day of our Master Yeshua. This is cool. This is like a glimpse into the relationship between the early, early messianic communities, if I could call them that, and their, like, the leadership that they had. You know, Paul was part of this congregational leadership, and he's writing to this congregation, he's saying, I am so proud of you guys, and you can be proud of me. And I just, I'm going to share with you personally, like, I'm really proud, I'm really proud of you guys as a community. You know, like, I'm part of us. It's, you know, I just, but I'm just, I'm so thankful for what the Father is doing with us. I'm so thankful for the level of unity and cooperation that we have. Like, I'm so thankful that I look forward to going to synagogue on Shabbat mornings. You know, like, it, it's, a thing, it's a thing of sweet anticipation. Like, we're actually gathering with people that, that we enjoy being with, who are pleasant. And I don't know, last week was just so cool. I don't know. Uh, Cindy made some remark about just like, how things are just go and even with just cooperating and taking stuff down and cleaning up and I said yeah we we have an amazing community I just think it's cool that we can see that dynamic in the early Israel movement too eh yeah um he 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 um here's something we can discuss over own egg if we actually get around to it or if any of us want to he he okay so he says like the letter kills but the spirit gives life now does that mean like reading the bible is a potentially lethal activity like being literary in the scriptures is, I, I don't think so. So I, I'd like to maybe discuss that over, over our fellowship meal. Um, he, um, he uses some, re some reasoning that is very rabbinic. It's like a traditional rabbinic way of, um, of logic, basically. It's called call the homer. And basically it's like you say, okay, you establish a fact and you say, if this is true, how much more is this true? 
And what could I use as an analogy? Okay, this, this is just an analogy from my own life, and I don't know if it totally applies, but okay, so maybe I would look at Tears and say, what if beautiful person? I'm biased, I'm her, I'm her Abba, her dad, right? So I'm like, I think Tears is a beautiful person. So in my life, I would say, if Tears is beautiful, how much more is Genevieve beautiful? This is what I would think, right? It's like, a, it's a how much more, and there are, there are tons of those, I don't know. You could think of some, some other examples, but that's one from, from me, and um, so this is, this is an analogy he makes. Okay, so he says, you know, the revelation of Elohim that was given at Mount Sinai when he brought the whole nation into this covenant, it was glorious. And that's the first, that's the first fact that he establishes. That was a glorious revelation. And then he goes on to say, and so if this revelation, and there was an element of this revelation where people died because, because the death penalty was applied. Um, this was a revelation where people felt some condemnation because they realized that this is, this is the law of God and I am like in total rebellion to him. You know, there are areas where I am a criminal against his majesty's government. Um, he says there's kind of this area to it, eh? And I mean, even the glory of it, you know, he gives this analogy of Moses and the glory on his face and then it fades and he says it's kind of a fading glory or something. So he says, you know, if this is the case, the new covenant in which God's Torah is written on our hearts through the Spirit, in which... Um, in which we are made alive through the Spirit, how much more glorious is it? And you know what? After, like, Yeshua comes back and there's no such thing as sin anymore and the old covenant is truly rendered obsolete because you just don't need any of those rules, because he has changed you within into, like, his total righteous personage, you know what? The glory of the new covenant is going to be the glory that remains. I, that, that's kind of how I understand this, eh? So he's not anti-Old Covenant. He's saying that was a glorious thing, but there's something even more glorious here. He's saying, like, how much more, right? Um, it's, the cov it's the covenant in which we are made righteous. So in that first covenant, he revealed himself and his righteousness. And in the process, he revealed how messed up we were, right? You, you, you look at the Word and you examine your life in the, in the light of the Word, that searchlight, and you realize, man, I am a mess. Man, I do not measure up, etc., right? But then you come to the new covenant and his spirit is breathed into you and he changes you from the inside out through the power of the gospel. And that is a glorious thing. I, I, I think that's kind of the heart of what Paul's getting at here. Here, here. Here's an interesting thing on the side. Okay, like, we've been talking about factoring in all the verses, right? There's some verses that maybe we just gloss over. Okay, um, you know how usually your Bible is called the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have these two testaments, right? Um, if you read church history, you'll discover that it actually, like, it was Marcion, who was a total heretic in the 200s, who really introduced this concept of the Old Testament and the New Testament, this, this scriptural dichotomy. And basically, Marcion said, okay, like, there are two gods. There's the God of the Old Testament, and um, he is like a God of wrath and judgment and law. And um, he's the bad God. And Jesus is the God of the New Testament. And he is a God of mercy and grace and love. And basically, like, he came to set you free from the God of the Old Testament and from all those rules. Okay, that's Marcionism. Um, the leaders of the early church, like the, the real leaders, they, they totally rejected Marcion. Um, they, they labeled him things like the firstborn of Satan. Okay, so he was rejected by the early church. But at the same time, some of his ideas have crept into our theology. Yes. The ghost of Marcion hangs over the church. We still have this dichotomy that in the Old Testament, God is one way, and in the New Testament, God is another way. You know, in the Old Testament, it's all about law and wrath, and boom, you know, and in the New Testament, it's all about kind of cuddly feelings and warm and loving and grace. And, but you know, like, au contraire, there's a lot of grace in the Old Testament, and you know what? There's some judgment in the New Testament, too. Read the book of Revelation. You know, there's some serious judgment going on. So, yeah, read Corinthians, read Acts, where a couple of people drop dead for, like, lying to the Holy Spirit, you know. So, so anyway, I, I want to establish that fact. But it is interesting that Paul does call the Torah the Old Covenant. He does call the Torah the Old Testament. In um, for 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, he talks about the, quote, reading of the Old, old Covenant or the Old Testament, right? So, you know... There is this place to recognize that the Torah is a previous covenant. It's older than the new covenant. But at the same time, I hate Marcion and I want nothing to do with his ideas. Right? So the idea is knowing where to draw the line. Wow, that was a nice little trip into church history for us. So, um, I'll finish with this thought and then I'll share a joke with you that I was going to share with you earlier and I kind of missed it by mistake. I hope that's okay. 
Paul says like, okay, he says, the Lord is the Spirit. Now that couldn't mean one of two things in the Hebrew mindset. He could be saying Yahweh, as in God is the Spirit, and where He is, there is freedom, or that could be a reference to Yeshua as the Master, right? Whatever the case may be, like, His Spirit, that's Him. So when we encounter a Spirit in our midst, that's Him. And that's where the freedom is. And if there's ever a point where we're not sensing a spirit, let's just stop the whole thing, let's put the brakes on the whole thing and say, where is he? Where is his spirit? Because, and the freedom, you can feel where there's the freedom, right? Yeah, that's, that's where it's at with the new covenant. 3 verse 18, he says, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of Yahweh, the, the Master's glory, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Um, so what's the idea here? Like, as we continue to look at Him and who He is, we're going to become like Him. So let's continue to spend time regularly in His presence, sitting at the table with Him, gazing on His glory. As we do that, we're going to be transformed to be like Him. And that's when we can really represent Him. So I'll share with you a little, uh, a little, a little story, and then we'll... Uh, We'll do the priestly blessing. So um, Paul, you know, one of the things he says in 2 Corinthians 3 here is, um, I don't know, some people must have accused Paul of like bad business dealings or peddling the word of God for gain or something. Because he says, we are not like many peddling the word of God. So um, I'll read you a little story about maybe uh, something along, along those lines. Let's see if I can find it here. Here we are. <laughs> so, um, an aging American school teacher, who was also a born-again Christian, sorely missed the good old days of teaching when she could preach from the Bible and lead in school prayers. She was alarmed at how little her students knew about religion and decided, since it was her last year of teaching, she was going to disregard the new strictures and teach religion anyway. So she announced to her class that she would have a contest each day. On the first day, she told the students... She would give $25 to the student who could first tell her who was the greatest man who ever lived. Immediately, Moishi, you know, like Moses, right? That's a very good Jewish name. Moishi began to wave his hand, but she ignored the kosher student in favor of those in her Sunday school class. As she went around the room, she was disappointed at the answers. Kathy, her best Bible scholar, had picked Noah because he saved all the animals. Um, finally, she picked on her rowdiest student in exasperation. I think the greatest man who ever lived was Alexander the Great because he conquered the whole world. Another said, I think it was Thomas Edison because he invented the light bulb. Sean, the br brightest student, finally in resignation, she called on Moishi, who was still wildly waving his hand. I think the greatest man who ever lived was Jesus our Savior, offered Moishi. The teacher was shocked and doled out the $25 reward to Moishi as she said, Oh, Moishi, I'm very surprised that you should be the one with the right answer. Well, personally, Moishi replied as he pocketed the money, I think it was Moses, but business is business. <laughs> so, essentially, Paul said that's, that's what we're not doing, right? Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com, and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return 
for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.